Okay, I want to welcome everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for coming. We appreciate your presence. I want to remind you this is a regular city council meeting. It is not a town hall. So politeness and courtesy, of course, are expected of everyone here this evening. At this time, please turn off and put away your cell phones. The use of cell phones is prohibited except for purposes explicitly authorized by state law, Texas Government Code 551.023. If you need to use your phone, please step outside. And I also want to remind you to refrain from any side conversations during the meeting or talking during any portion. Of course, if you filled out a comment card to speak on an agenda item tonight during the three minute comment section, we will call you to the podium. Please keep in mind when you come to the podium that council is not allowed to engage in discussions with you at that point in the meeting. Make sure you introduce yourself and tell us what ward you are from. Public comments are also acceptable during the public hearing section. Once again, no council discussion is allowed during that section either. It is important, once again, that you speak from the podium for official recording of this meeting for those on Zoom and come to the podium, state your first name, last name, and ward number. If you don't have the opportunity to make your voice heard this evening, please email me or your council member with your thoughts. Email addresses can be found on the city website. So I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Please stand for the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, we have a quorum this evening. Council Member Rodriguez is out for family business. Uh, proof of notice, City Secretary. Uh, yes, Mayor, the notice of this meeting was posted on October 14th by 2 p.m. Okay, thank you. Do we have any public comments this evening? We have one public comment this evening from Jim Street, Ward 1. Uh, he'd like to make a comment on the Boards and Commissions of Ordinance, uh, Ordinance 2022-10-03. Okay, Mr. Street. Yeah, I'm Jim Street, Board One, and Gio already told you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and I have talked to all of you and emailed and told most of you. Uh, that I'm a broken record, but <clears throat> we really need the Transportation Committee. I was pleased to see the Airport Board because there was some talk about that might also be canceled. I'm glad to see that's in the new ordinance. But the ordinance does say the Transportation Committee shall be canceled. And I think that's a big mistake. It was formed back when the 67th study was going on and it was canceled. It was, well, we only got four people and uh, it, then it was canceled because it, in the words of, of Mayor Ramos, well, it was just done for the study and the study is over. But the study did not solve transportation issues that we got coming down the road. And that is three times truck traffic from the border once the bridge is completed. The border will also have rail traffic, and the, the South Florida line will again be active with, with trains running up and down. That's a problem. The, we still have the problem with the blockage of the tracks at the, 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 the Fifth Street where they stop for crew changes. 25 years, they honored the agreement to stop short of Fifth Street. And then one day they decided, oh, they had to change it at, at the depot. Uh, and that and we've not made any progress there, but that's something we still need to work on. For the truck traffic, we need to look at a, a truck bypass. There was even talk of a rail bypass. I think that's way down the road and probably impossible. But uh, we do need a crew change out of town, get the crew change out of town. There was a plan on the east side and there was a million dollars in the bank in change. Uh, several years ago, and the then city council canceled that broad debt contract. There also was a plan for another one east of town, and I was told that was stopped because the animal center was built there. I don't see how that could have interfered with, with having a, a crew change there. But anyway, we don't have it. But if we could get the crew change out of town, that would be very worthwhile. Truck bypass is going to be needed someday in the future. I think there are a lot of issues. I'm more than happy to serve on on that and the airport board, I've got experience in the in, in 
a lot of experience at airports, and I have emailed them and talked to all of you about it. So I'm all good, but let's get the transportation community get back on there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, I want to give a shout out to my lifelong friend, Sarah Bow and her new husband, Dr. Gluck. May they have many years of matrimonial bliss. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Okay, City Secretary, any other public comments? Uh, that concludes public comments. Okay, good. I have a proclamation this evening for National Friends of Libraries Week. Okay, if I can have representatives come join me. Okay, National Friends of Library Week, whereas friends in the public Alpine Public Library raise money. It enables our library to move from good to great, providing the resources for additional programming, much needed equipment, support for children's summer reading and special events throughout the year. And whereas the work of the friends highlights on an ongoing basis, the fact that our library is the cornerstone of the community, providing opportunities for all to engage in the joy of lifelong learning and connect with the thoughts and ideas of others from ages past to the present. And whereas the friends understand the critical importance of well-funded libraries and advocate to ensure that our library gets the resources it needs to provide a wide variety of services to all ages, including access to print and electronic materials, along with expert assistance in research, Readers Advisory and Children's Services, and whereas the friends' gift of their time and commitment to the library sets an example for all in how volunteerism leads to positive civic engagement and the betterment of our community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Catherine Eves, Mayor of the City of Alpine, on behalf of the community, we are, do hereby recognize October 16th to 22nd 2022 as Friends of Libraries Week in Alpine, Worcester County, Texas, and urge everyone to join the Friends of the Library and thank them for all they do to make our library and community so much better. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand this 18th day of October in the year 2022. Can we get to that? I think up front would be better. But okay. We really would like all of you. Council's going to photobomb. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. I just want to let you know that the, the president of the library board of directors and another board member wanted to be here to uh, for this proclamation, but they're at the library. Oh. <laughs> they're tutoring. They're doing it. The uh, adult education okay. experience. So it never stops. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Okay, city mayor report. So meet with the mayor discussions. Um, one resident suggested maybe at town hall meetings, we can have a poster for people to rank their favorite to least favorite event or things to support, such as if your favorite is the library to rank it as your favorite, uh, libraries, parks, arts, music, etc. <clears throat> Another resident asked, would partnering with other cities such as Marfa, Fort Davis, and Marathon to raise our collective population and income levels to a position where we could get more upscale stores to come to the area be something that we might want to work toward? So that's something for us to discuss. They suggested clothing stores such as JCPenney's and Kohl's. Uh, another one asked, should we partner with the university and do a cost of living survey? And another one suggested that for our city workers, we have an employee of the month for each department, possibly. Winners receive something such as a gift card, an extended lunch period, or a day where they can leave at four instead of five, et cetera. 
Upcoming events, the next town hall meeting is sponsored by council member Stokes. It's tomorrow at Alpine Elementary <laughs> at 6 p.m. And then the next one after that will be Saturday, November 5th at 2 p.m. at the Granada. Please remember, we do have a city radio show. It's called City Talk, and it will be this Thursday, the 20th at 9.05 a.m. And APD and the Visitor Center will present at that radio show. And then the next meet with the mayor will be on Saturday, the 29th at the Farmer's Market, 1030 to 12. All right, we have no city attorney report, but we do have a city manager report. So in the packets, I included the August and the September financial report. Um, I did just want to briefly discuss the September one. This is as of 930. So it's not actually where we're ending for the year. We still have accruals. Um, we have utilities that are coming in. We have uh, invoices and MPO that you know we ended the year with that we're still paying on. So I kind of wanted to give the public, and um, since it was in the packet, I didn't do a presentation, um, where we're at. So the general fund, um, we budgeted 6.3 million. We brought in 5.5 million as of 930. Um, in revenue expenses, of course, we budget the 6.3 because we do have a balanced budget. And we're at 5.0 million. So based off of the projected year in, we are within that three to 400,000 that would go towards the additional fund balance to move into this fiscal year. It is a very projected, I'd love to say I can be on the dot and I can get it exact, but we have those expenses that come in at the end of the fiscal year that we don't necessarily plan for. Um, we know our electric bills average out you know, so much a month, but we do have that one month that may spike. Um, we still have that every now and then purchase that didn't follow policy that we end up with a, an expense that has to be recorded, um, which is why you, you've heard me and the staff has heard me stop spending after the 15th so that we can see where we're going to be at the end of the year. So overall, the general fund did well. Um, we are projecting to have um, addition to the fund balance. I just can't predict currently what exactly it is until we get the rest of the accrual in. For the wastewater treatment plant, we budgeted 5.8 in revenues and expenses. On revenues, we brought in 5 point, that's 5,048,653, and we expended 4,832,504. Uh, Once again, there is a little bit of cushion to go towards the net position. We do have some higher um, pending invoices um, with some of the well damaged things that still need to be processed. So we still will have a little bit of a net position change, just not as significant as we thought we would. Um, airport, gotta love them. We actually amended the budget to include additional revenue. Um, the first time in 10 years since I've been with the city, um, they actually are bringing in more money than we anticipated. So we amended the budget to 918,254. Um, they brought in 933,538, still more than what we projected. Megan, is that fuel? That is fuel. So 90% of their budget is fuel. But what comes with fuel revenue is fuel cost. <laughs> they spent $1,007,377. So they still exceed what they brought in, but I also have to remind the public and, and the council, the fuel that is purchased that last month sits in tanks as inventory. So this is just a revenue expense. It doesn't show you all the asset and liability side as well. So they still do balance out fairly well. Um, the downside to the airport, and you'll hear this throughout the audit process, is they, they balance, or they'll come slightly under um, the, basically they'll use part of their reserves because of depreciation. So unless we keep putting into the airport, everything is depreciating. So that does get reported as part of a, a business-like uh, account, but they're still doing well. Um, the hot fund, um, we budgeted 879,000 in revenues and expenses. Part of that 879,000 last fiscal year, council approved two different amendments 
to utilize fund balance towards the remodel of the visitor center. So we recorded it for budget purposes to look like an income. We don't actually like move the money because they're, it's there, there's nowhere to move it. Um, so ideally they should have brought in about 600, 625,000 in just hot funds. As of 9.30, they brought in 677,621. This is where Chris has the conversation with me or I have the conversation with Chris, you need to spend it, you need to spend it um, because we are required to spend at least 51% on advertising. So a lot of the big expenses get hit at the end because we're trying to catch up on the advertising. The other side to this is it doesn't include the last quarter payments. So hotels have until October 20th to pay their monthly and quarter payments for last fiscal year. So this is just as of 9.30. So as of 9.30, they had already exceeded what we thought that they would bring in. Their expenses are 862,958. Now remember, 279,000 had been put aside part of fund balance for the remodel of the visitor center. So if you subtract that, they're still within uh, their budget. The utility gas, um, we budgeted 2 2,026,970. They brought in $1,847,847 and they expended $1,712,830, um, which is great. We do have to do some, some estimating when it comes to revenue because we don't know how cold it's gonna get. I know when I turned on the gas heater this morning, I was excited, said he's gonna make some money, but at the same time, I'm gonna have to pay that bill. But we don't know if it's gonna be a warm winter, it's gonna be a cold winter, it, it's gonna be highs and lows. I, I, I don't know how many people read the almanac, but it's kind of become my thing. Let's go look at the almanac, what's it gonna say? Um, expenses, I'm, I'm proud of the gas department because they did have some emergencies come up this past fiscal year. Everyone is really well aware that the gates that we inherited, we had some major malfunction with them. The gas department put in overtime, they had to buy the equipment and then search for someone to help them fix it. And um, so despite having some of those emergencies, they still came under budget with their revenue. So this goes towards their net position. So um, they're on track, really excited. Um, interest in thinking, this is where we pay our debt from for the general fund. This is the general funds portion of debt. We budgeted $148,758 in revenue and expense. Revenue came in at $158,512. And of course our expense comes in at $148,758. We don't budget more in expenses or revenue than we need. We bring in more revenue because people are paying off um, their taxes. Properties are being sold, we're getting that delinquent tax that's coming back in. But when we look at the tax rate for IMS, we're only bringing in what we need to pay that year's debt. We're not bringing in extra so that we can you know, hold it somewhere and, and go into debt down the road. We only budget what we need. The extra that comes in can be utilized down the road to go towards the first payment, a down payment of future debt. We can't use it for anything else. So once it's in this account, it stays in this account. So overall, as of 9.30, um, the projected year ends are on target. Um, everyone will either have a little bit extra towards their fund balance or net position, or they'll balance out. Um, when we get through October, you'll get kind of two presentations with finance. You'll get the where we are at with accruals for fiscal year 22. And then of course, where we're at for 23 in October. We typically accrue about 60 to 90 days the first part of the year. This is the last effort to get all those bills in and get them paid so we can post them to the correct fiscal year. We don't have a formal policy in place yet that has that cutoff date, but we try within the first 60 and 90 days. Yes, we beg companies to pay them. Send us your invoice um, so that we're not having to extend this or drag it out. Um, and we do work with all the departments with, hey, you've got some open POs, let's get them taken care of. But overall, the city does continue to do a good job with their finances. And August is in there, but it's kind of a 
a mute point, <laughs> but I, I wanted it to be available for everyone in the public to see as well. So you could see the progression with all the different months. All right, any other questions? Thanks, Megan, for all the numbers. Love them. <laughs> numbers don't yell at you. <laughs> That's true. I've never looked at it. Like They're either black or white. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to city staff updates. Jennifer, come on up. Animal services. Stuff I understand now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. She has numbers too. I do have pie numbers. charts. Yeah. They're huge. I can get that. Yeah, try and throw oh. animal pictures in there to distract you. Tell you what one of these animal costs you. <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm Jennifer I'm with the Animal Services for some of y'all that might not know. Um, this is the third quarterly report for um, Animal Services. That's uh, July, August, and September. So our stray intakes, um, we saw 82 total stray intakes um, those three months by being re repeat offenders. Um, the majority of our cats were found in ward four and five, and our majority of our dogs were found in two and four. Um, out of those strays, uh, 26 of the cat, out of 26 cats, only one was returned to owner. Uh, out of 56 dogs, 41 was returned to owner. So that's pretty good for dog stats, um, not good for cats. Uh, feral cat intakes, we had 48 total, uh, majority coming from wards one and four. Surrenders, we saw 11 surrenders come through our shelter, five cats and six dogs. Other intakes, uh, eight dogs were brought in for quarantine. Um, that's the most we've ever seen in my career that I can think of in, at one, one point in a three month span, um, just throwing it out there. Uh, two cats and one dogs were returned after adoption. They just didn't fit in the home. No fault of their own. Um, adoptions, 26 total adoptions. Uh, 18 were cats, eight were dogs. Um, we did have a clear the shelter event in August, which result resulted of half of those adoptions. So uh, that was fantastic. We did a P PSA about it. So if you, I don't know if y'all saw it, but it was out there. Um, transports, we transported 13 total animals, 13, um, or excuse me, 12 cats and one dog. Other outcomes, uh, two animals died due to medical reasons and one dog unfortunately had to be euthanized because he was deemed dangerous. Um, end of month shelter counts. So um, starting in July, we had 15 cats and 11 dogs. And then by the end of September, we had 14 cats and 22 dogs. So not a, not a huge increase or decrease there. Um, we did see, you know, there was a little trend there, but pretty staying pretty consistent, which we like to see. Uh, microchips, we placed eight total microchips, uh, six were dogs and two were cats. Bites, this is where our quarantine numbers come in. Uh, we had 16 total, which was a lot um, for us. You can see a giant spike there. Um, I'd like to remind the public to be very careful when you're handling animals that you don't know. Um, if you see a loose animal, make sure and call it in. Um, we want to avoid this situation. It's not good for our people or our pets. So um, just be very cautious when you're out there. Um, most of the bites did occur in ward one and four. Uh, citations, uh, 78 total citations issued. Uh, most were running at large as it, they normally are. Uh, PSAs, so uh, for July, we did city licensing. Um, that re did result in a couple, not as many as I'd like, but we're, we're working on that. Um, we did uh, clear the shelter of uh, PSA for August, which was that for that month. And September uh, was a PSA for rehoming. Um, I can tell you today, I even I had three or four people call about rehoming. So um, it seems to be an, an ongoing thing, people looking to rehome their pets. So um, if any you're talking to your friends or family or anything like that, and they're, they're wanting to rehome, the, the PSA is on the city website. That's it. Questions? I have a question for you. Sure. How many dogs and how many cats can this shelter hold comfortably? Comfortably. <laughs> 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 okay. So we have 24 large dog runs in our back air back kennel areas. 
Um, we have a puppy room that can hold nine. This is just if we were just putting one dog in each kennel. Let's just say that, or one cat. Um, cats, we have nine in our cattery. Um, we also have a intake room and a uh, quarantine room that can also hold um, if we have overflow. I can tell you that at times we have stacked cats in, in wire crates temporarily um, when we had a lot. Kitten season is a thing. So um, we don't have a ton of room. I thought it'd be good for the council and the public to know it's not a huge shelter. So when they have 22 dogs, there's not much space for extra. Mm -hmm. And we are short staff. We're still looking for staffing. Uh, check out the city website for that. Um, we need to get those filled because 22 dogs is a lot for us when we don't have a lot of people. I have a question for you. Yeah. Why do some wards seem to have bigger issues with the animals? than other wards or do you have any time? I'm not sure so I started doing collecting this information on where they're coming from just to kind of get a general idea I don't know if it's just fencing if it's just uh, maybe areas that need more education on ownership I'm not a hundred percent sure um, it, at this point it's just been a few years of data collecting to kind of just see where our problem areas are okay thank you yeah. And do y'all still collect like quilts and towels and blankets and and you can even leave them on the bench, can't you? Yes. I mean, because I've done that several times when I when y'all are really busy or if it's after hours, I'll leave them on the bench and they can be picked up. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. If there's anything that we can't use for some reason at the shelter, anything that's too filled with too much fluff, we probably won't use because it makes a mess. Or um, something too big that we can't do. for them. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything that we can't put into a regular washing machine, um, that will all go to the Humane Society thrift store where they can resell it. And they do help us with a lot of things as well. Um, there also is a pet food pantry. I may have mentioned it during this, these meetings at some point. Um, so if you do want to donate food and it's not something that we use at the shelter, we feed science diet, um, then we will put it into our food pantry, which is a place where the community can go to get um, free pet food. If you're, if you're in a bind, that's, you know, people sometimes are, oh my gosh, I can't feed my pet. You know, I'm having a hard time this month. I got to, I got to take it back to the shelter. I got to take it into the shelter. Um, this is kind of helping those type of people out um, to hopefully keep their pets in their homes. It is so. expensive. It is expensive. Yeah. Pet food is very expensive. So and is the pet food pantry at your location? It's not. We do um, house our overflow and our storage unit out there, but we actually have it um, at the Humane Society. Um, they have an office space that's right there on Fifth Street, right across from the elementary school. And that is on the website? On our website, I'm not sure, but I will put it there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It's probably in the news feed. We just need to update and move it back to the front. So it's okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next Thank time. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, Heather, Visitor Center Report. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So, um, I last talked to you guys, I think, in the, in the beginning of August. So um, I'm only going to give you August and September data here. Um, we really saw um, a lot more visitors this August come through the visitor center uh, compared to last year. So uh, 413 compared to 190 the year prior. And then September, the numbers were very similar. We typically um, like have seen a drop in September when everyone goes back to school. Mm -hmm. We tend to see a big drop. Um, September, I think we saw a lot of, or August, we saw a lot of people here um, whenever the heat finally kind of broke everywhere and uh, we saw people come out here. Um, we also had some good events that drove people here, but um, yeah, the September numbers are pretty typical. Uh, now we're starting to see the huge fall spike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been very obvious the last couple weeks. So um, we'll give you those numbers next time. Um, other stuff that we did at the Visitor Center, um, direct mail marketing. We continue to send out Alpine information all over the country with information packets and postcards. Alpine brochures go to other travel centers. And then um, we do event bags for local stuff. Uh, so in the last two months, we did uh, 33 info packets, 200 
30 um, postcards, 950 brochures. Um, that's to the mostly to the Texas Information Centers, the the big huge uh, text dot centers that you see all over the state. We're sending them our stuff. Um, our largest one that takes the most stuff is always Langtree, which is going to be on 90. So as people head on 90 this way, um, they pick up a lot of Alpine stuff. They actually put together an entire Big Bend packet at that visitor center because they go through so much stuff. Um, but uh, I had in there that the 950 brochures did not include the state fair, but actually theirs kept getting sent back. So um, our stuff will make it to the state fair on Saturday when I go there. Um, it's not there yet. Um, but in addition to all this, we did uh, 297 event bags, which is a lot. Um, we, and then we did even more just already at the beginning of this month. So we've been doing a lot of event bags for, uh, different things. Uh, ranch rodeo, uh, had a, had a bunch, uh, did some for, uh, can you remember now what, the, sorry, <laughs> uh, no. So basically the way we designate if they're going to get an event bag or if they're going to, if I'm going to set up on site, if they get the event bags, it's because they have uh, designated attendees. So if it's like a conference that people sign up for, uh, oh, I know what all of them were for, the uh, bird conference that was here in the, that's what all of them were for. I just remembered. Oh. Um, but uh, that, uh, or Native Plant Society, that's what Native it was. Plant. I gave them a bunch of bird stuff because I figured they'd like that. But um, if they, they knew who all was coming. So they all signed up for that event. They Big Ben Ranch Rodeo, we're giving them all of the event bags for the actual people who are in the rodeo. And then I set up on site for things like the Bluegrass Festival where anyone can walk up and buy a ticket. Um, so that's the difference in between if we do an event bag or if I'm on site. Because um, if I if I already have given them event bags, then me being on site is kind of like basically just the same information again. Of course, they get my added personality to tell them all about it, but um, it would be basically giving them the same information. So um, moving on, visit Alpine on location. Uh, These are some of the places that I was. Um, the Big Ben Ranch Rodeo uh, it's held every August in Alpine raises funds for the Saul Ross Rodeo Scholarships. It's a two-day event that brings 16 teams from all over the country to Alpine for the weekend. The teams have anywhere from four to six members, and most of them travel with their families. So it does bring in a lot of out-of-town visitors. We did the event bags for the participants. Um, and then I was on site Friday evening to give out information because, again, we don't know who else is going to come just actually watch the rodeo. So I was there on Friday night. Um, Miss Comanche Springs, uh, sweetheart Loretta, she's from Fort Stockton. She was there and hung out at the tent and passed out stuff, too. Um, and then the next thing that I did was in August, uh, Fiesta 1888, that was with the Tejano legends, Ruben Ramos and little Joe headlining this event that brought thousands of people to historic Murphy street. Um, the foot traffic during the day when I was there with vendors and the classic car show was light, but people started coming to like claim their spots later on as the concert times got closer. Um, and because this was the first year for Fiesta 1888 to be in this format, um, we, I will, I will for sure was not, I wasn't sure what to expect from it. Um, but as the night went on, um, there was just more and more people in terms of, um, getting people to Alpine, it was definitely a success. So, um, we were there, uh, I went during the day, left for a little bit and then went back at night and it was just a complete change in the entire environment from, from day to night. So, um, then the Saul Ross, uh, State University Rodeo. Uh, Saul Ross is the birthplace of college rodeo. It hosts the largest college rodeo in the country every September. Uh, this year, they had approximately 100 entries uh, with athletes and their families coming to cheer them on. Um, the rodeo is also a great event for visitors to the area. We have a lot of visitors who don't know that they're here when the rodeo is happening, but are very excited to go see one. Um, I had to visit Alpine's uh, tent on site Friday during the daytime slack competition and Friday evening for the nightly performances. So, um, and they are... Uh, we also had commercials that ran this year because it was on the uh, they they carried the rodeo on the on the Cowboy Channel and um, out visit Alpine had commercials uh, and then they had to so to be carried on the Cowboy Channel they had to have a certain number of local businesses do commercials too so there was us and Saul Ross and then there was local businesses that had commercials that aired during the entire event um, so anybody could watch it from anywhere um, and then use of the pavilion uh, we have somebody that asked to host a Poetry Slam. Um, it's been held now, uh, this says twice, but actually it would have been just this yesterday. Um, I don't know if they met though, because it's it was raining and I have no idea if they were there or not, but um, they aren't drawing big crowds, but both times I've received really good visit, uh, feedback from visitors who, who went to it, like people from out of the area. Um, they really enjoyed it. So uh, it's just, 
every third Monday um, out there and it's poetry or music or whatever anybody wants to do. Um, like I said, the, the nice thing about the pavilion and the bathroom space is that they can have it there without us being there. Cause again, I did not make it on, on a Monday night is not to, I, it's hard for me with my child in school. Now, so I was not there. Um, then uh, upcoming stuff that we have going on. Uh, so the, the Texas Heritage Trail booth at the State Fair is um, the only statewide travel exhibit at the State Fair and Alpine will be the featured day this Saturday on Saturday, October 22nd. So it's staffed by the Texas Heritage Trail region personnel and then partners, which will be us. Um, so it operates like a miniature visitor center. We'll have banners, information about all of the uh, Heritage Trail re regions. And then Alpine, uh, we're part of the Texas Mountain Trail region. Uh, so we were just lucky enough, they open it up to uh, anybody, any of the towns to try to claim a day. And I got on there the day it opened up and we a uh, day that worked for me to go. So we're gonna be able to be there this Saturday. Um, it's all day. Uh, the booth is located at the Go Texas Pavilion. Um, we had to have a minimum of two people there to handle the large volume of visitors that'll be passing through. So um, we're gonna have the Alpine brochures and then all of our giveaways. And we're actually gonna be able to do a um, weekend giveaway for someone to come here in exchange for them signing up to receive our newsletter. Um, so we're gonna be there all day Saturday. So come to the state fair and see us. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have a bunch of brand new uh, branded merchandise to take, uh, the new banner highlighting all the Texas travel awards that we won this year. Um, it looks really nice. So, um, and then other upcoming events, we've got uh, Visit Alpine is working with Alpine Police Department. Um, we've gotten great sponsors again this year to do the pumpkin giveaway. Uh, last year we did it at the school, but this year with the visitor center um, having the pavilion completed, we're going to do it there. So that will be uh, Saturday, October 29th from 11 to 3 at the visitor center. It'll be Porter's donating um, hundreds of pumpkins again. Daryl and his team are the ones who come out and lay out all the pumpkins and give them to the kids. And um, Out West has given us uh, hay again to do a hay maze in the yard. And JC Bounce Houses is doing uh, the bounce house. And then we're going to have games and stuff. Um, with the Big Bend Parks and Recreation for Kids group um, act, helping with that part. And Daryl gets more volunteers from all over. Uh, so uh, it'll be Saturday and it's a entirely free family event uh, on the 29th. Also coming up, we've got, of course, Art Walk. That's the big ne next big event downtown. Uh, we are working on hosting some uh, public art stuff during that. So uh, look for more on that to come. And then uh, Christmas and Alpine planning has begun. Alpine Historic Association is again hosting the Lighted Stroll. And uh, we are working with uh, hopefully the library and some different people to do the events at the old schoolhouse again. Last year I did painting at the schoolhouse and we're going to do that again. We have music booked. So um, the rest of the stroll is like forest stuff, but we're hoping ours is going to be more like everybody sing along kids songs since we're doing the kids event at the schoolhouse so um we're getting started on all of that too so that's what, what i have what coming up. Is that? that's going to be that'll be the third um december 3rd it's the first weekend um of december and it will Saul Ross is doing their tree lighting a little bit earlier in the week but then they're going to relight that night just like they did that <laughs> because they want to have it it'll finish uh, everything finishes up there with the big concert so and that's all the um their their uh director music director puts all the musicians together and brings them all in from all over for that so any questions yeah i will it's gonna be interesting and i can't wait i can't wait to see it so <laughs> you recorded it all <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay chris torres on quarterly report <clears throat> Uh, hello, uh, I'm Chris Rugia, your Director of Tourism. So this is our quarterly report for the last quarter of our fiscal year. So if I get that next slide. As Megan mentioned, as of September 30th, we had collected $677,000 in hotel occupancy tax funds. And as she also said, October is a, is a big wave of collection. So we are expecting over 725,000, which would be our second year ever to break that $700,000 mark. So that's, that's a good year. Um, next slide. Uh, I wanted to show you a few of the ad campaigns we've recently done. 
as uh, Heather mentioned, uh, Alpine won seven Texas Travel Awards. So we decided to use that as a hook for some campaigns. So uh, between print and digital uh, ads, we ran with Texas Monthly, AAA Texas Explorer, Austin Monthly, San Antonio Magazine, and Texas Music Magazine. And those things are still, are still going on. Uh, we're also doing a, a giveaway contest with, with uh, Austin Monthly, San Antonio, and Texas Music. That's one company that through all those channels, we're collecting email addresses for our newsletter and we're giving away uh, two nights and, and two dinners uh, for the winner. So next slide. We also, uh, we are on ongoing basis doing our co-op advertising with Martha and Fort Davis. Uh, these are great partners. Martha, in particular, has been really game for anything we want to do. Abby over, uh, Abby Boyd, my counterpart there, really easy to work with, really smart and, uh, and uh, enthusiastic about working with Alpine. And so that's been great. This is a, so on the left, that is an advertorial uh, that focuses on lodging in Alpine and Marfa that is uh, formatted like a magazine feature that's running in Texas Monthly. And then on the right is a partnership with the Big Bend Film Commission, who uh, at the end of the month will be at the Austin Film Festival. And so I've worked with their director for a few years now, uh, doing, coming up with ideas for how to market to the filmmakers who come to suggest Alpine as a place to come and film. And so this year we we made a, this is a fake movie poster basically. So, uh, so we made a little award uh, award icons that just talk about all the things that are good about this area for filmmakers. And it also includes our, our lodging rebate, which uh, uh, we have $5,000 budgeted out of promotion of the arts. But I spoke to Justin Bragel at Texas Hotel Lodging Association, and I haven't told Megan this yet, so I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> and so he told me that uh, because we're using this uh, the rebate as an anchor for advertising, we can use advertising dollars to fund it. So if we get more, if we happen to be lucky enough to get more films coming, then we have budgeted a promotion of the arts. We aren't limited by that 15% cap. So we can... He's telling me that we're going to need the 51%, not yes. to worry about the others. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but I, think, I think we will. But uh, let's see. So then... Uh, different media placements we've had. As Heather mentioned, the Cowboy Channel carried the Sol Ross Rodeo and uh, rodeo coach CJ Aragon told me that they reported over 210,000 views. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's through the web or they wouldn't, I don't know how they track it otherwise uh, over cable or something. You had to pay. Oh, you had it with pay per? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, dang. Okay, then. Uh, <laughs> uh, we also had uh, some really good coverage in Texas highways. On the, the page you're seeing is their events page. Uh, totally unexpected. They called out the Big Ben Bluegrass Festival, gave them well over two thirds of a page uh, for the first Big Ben Bluegrass Festival. There was also a, a column about visiting the Big Ben that actually had a lengthy write up about the Alpine Public Library that the mm -hmm. visitor had stopped in there. Um, let's see, the story of art in America is an Amazon Prime TV show that approached they approached the Big Bend Arts Council, which they had found through the Texas Commission on the Arts, because Alpine is uh, most of Al downtown Alpine is a designated cultural arts district. And this is a, a TV show that uh, focuses on different kind of out of the way places and the artists there. And they <laughs> wanted to come to Alpine. And so we had a Zoom meeting of the Jan Muller of the Arts Council asked me to uh, talk to them, you know, join them. And so uh, I ran it by Megan, and there was a, uh, you know, a co-production kind of sponsorship <laughs> dollars that wasn't that high that we were able to do out of last fiscal year towards advertising, towards that 51%. So that's going to happen. It, it should film in next spring. And so uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be having a committee together with the Arts Council to talk about what... Uh, a slate of potential interview, you know, artists for them to profile, and then they'll select from the group that that we send to them. And so they'll do profiles on five or six artists trying to give a representation of of the the arts in Alpine. So that's pretty nice. 
Uh, True West Magazine for the second time uh, has named the Museum of the Big Ben one of the top 10 Western museums. So that was nice. And then this is this quarter, but I just found out about it. I was uh, talking with the Brian Schroeder at Center for Big Ben Studies and he said, oh, did you see the New Yorker? I said, well, no, uh, and they, I don't, I can't, I don't have that much time to read, so I, I don't, I don't read every week the New Yorker, but this is, most of the media that I've talked, that I tend to talk to you about is state media. We, we, most of our visitors are in state. This is nationwide media. They did a lengthy feature on uh, the Center for Big Bend Studies and their work. It was written by Rachel Monroe and Marfa. She's a uh, She's a writer, been there for some time, and she writes for, for them mostly web things, but the editors liked it so much that they put it in the print publication. And so uh, millions of people will see this article about the Center for Big Gun Studies. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Hmm? We, did we, for their conference? we do, no, yeah, we do. we do, for the, just for the conference. conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so lastly, uh, we have our visitor dashboard that is now fully functional. Uh, I do still have a learning curve. Uh, I had a meeting with the with their rep last week, kind of talking to them about you know helping me to determine what's the best material to send to Megan every month, so that she has a good snapshot that she's getting the same information, so that we can track uh, changes. But also uh, getting. Uh, getting some input on what's what are the best things to look at for our future planning. But I wanted to show you the a couple of things. This is their visitor economy index, which I am going to get from them a little better picture, but it's not just visitation. It also includes uh, it also includes credit card information. So not just uh, hotel spending, but other traveler spending as well. And so this shows us that most of the year, most months of the of the the of 2022, we were an improvement that that visitor economy index, which I'll have a better definition of soon from them, uh, that if on an average out all the months, we were up 12% over 2021. Uh, May, June, and July dipped a little bit, but I don't think we dipped in hotel occupancy tax collection. So I think that's probably the um, average amount that our visitors were spending on their stay would explain that difference. Uh, so then the next slide, this, uh, this chart shows visitor spending versus visitation. And the, uh, the, top, uh, the top destination or, or uh, origin market is Midland Odessa with the, much, the longest ones. And that's what we would expect because it's easiest for them to get here. But what we see in this chart is that uh, the individual traveler from Midland spends a little bit less than the, the individual traveler from these other markets, which also makes sense because it's an easy trip for them. It would tend to be, uh, it could be a single overnight and still be a great trip for somebody from Midland, whereas from if you're coming from Dallas, you're gonna maybe stay longer and spend more. Uh, but that said, Midland and Odessa still represent 28% of our total travel spending. So, these are the kinds of things I'll be looking at. One of the big things I'm working with this article on is getting really good reports on event performance. As I told you before, we, I really want to see against a weekend with no events, how did, you know, so I can report to our hotel occupancy tax committee real numbers of how our, how our grant money performed and so that they can then recommend to you with better information. So that's what we're looking at. That, that's our last quarter. Yeah. I have a comment. Yes. <clears throat> One of the groups that the Hot Committee supports is the Big Ben Film Commission. And in a current uh, Ford truck advertising, the three cowboys at the visitor center is briefly seen as the truck drives by. Nice. <laughs> and uh, you kind of have to know Alpine and the three cowboys, but it's pretty neat to see them. Well, we're getting a sign made for that. So that you're going to get the names and all that. Yeah, we'll yeah. know who the cowboys are. And that is by Bob. So that's in one. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've been holding down that fence for a long time. <laughs> exactly. Last year, no, they not. <laughs> it had to be mended. Yeah. 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 Well, Any thank other you. questions? No, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good, Good job, Chris. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. All right. Police Department report by Chief Lasoya.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello to the crowd. Um, here to uh, make my presentation, just go right into it. Um, starting tomorrow, we have our, uh, our Zuzu Burke Memorial Walk and Vigil. We start at the university and we'll work our way down from Sol Ross uh, down to the courthouse gazebo. Uh, Friday, this past Friday was the, uh, the six year uh, anniversary of, of her being reported missing. And uh, it was actually the night that she was on the date we had the, uh, we were having the, the vigil before it was uh, made to her. So that night, that Wednesday night was her night with, uh, with our suspect there. Um, so, uh, and then we have, as Heather mentioned, we have our great pumpkin giveaway. Thank you for Chris for making these awesome uh, posters and signs. Um, so one of the things that we decided with this pumpkin, uh, I love the way that Heather has set up her visitor center. It gives it a good, uh, a good location. Actually, I'm thinking about next year having our national night out there. Uh, we have plenty of light. We ran out of light this year here at, the, at Baines Park. So uh, I think it's going to be a good, good location for it. And we'll have one of the things that's also good with it is it's on the main road and we'll get uh, a lot of people's attention. Thank you so much to Porters out West, uh, JNC bouncers, they're, they've always come through for us. This is the third time we've had this event and uh, we I've talked to the principal of the school. He's good encouraging the children to come over. And so uh, basically it also takes it out of their hands to have to, the responsibility of having the, having the children there. Um, as y'all mentioned earlier, sorry y'all missing delicious hot dogs. Have you, to ever to ever say that you have a, a, a smoked hot dog from Brick Bolt, that was delicious. So Just rub it in, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would I would have made some adjustments on the, on the agenda, but here we go. <laughs> um, and again, thank you to Porter's um, for their donations, the Payanas family, Skelton's Runway, uh, J and C Bouncers again, and of course Brick Bolt. Uh, we had so many organizations there. This was one of the first times that we had actual organizations there um, that, that came across, and that was through, remind me, ma'am, the uh, Alpine Business. Oh, community, community projects. There you go. Mm -hmm. And so they had all these organizations there. We had the, the library, the Humane Society. Of course, the, the Crisis Center is always a good uh, sponsor of ours. Um, I can't remember all that. Got them here. Uh, the Humane Society, Sunshine House, Public Library, a Family Crisis Center, and the Bigger Regional Hospital District. So it was great to have those organizations there to, to uh, join part of this. Um, we this past month we also had the we participated in the JobCon, and so we actually got to uh, go out there, interact with the children. That actually these were high school children, so they, it was more of a it was good to be out there for us because it would it also gives us a little. Uh, uh, career fair for us. And so, uh, so they got to see a lot of stuff that we did, uh, that we do at the police department. We had, uh, Lieutenant Coffin was out there with his, with his, with his evidence, uh, fingerprinting and everything, all, all the other tools that he uses. We had our new bicycles out there. Uh, we had them go through our patrol cars and, uh, get, uh, check out some of the equipment. Uh, some of the kids procedure were putting on the, our, our vests. So it was good for them to, to experience that. Uh, this year we had, uh, we were, I was approached by a parent that needed assistance with uh, uh, school supplies. And so uh, we this, we had our first school supplies drive. Uh, thanks to the American Legion, they made a great donation of $500, True Value donated backpacks. Um, and we had also other persons just bring stuff over to the police department. So it was a good first time for that. And as far as department training uh, for these last two months, Captain Fierro and Lieutenant Kaufman attended the Crimes Against Children Conference in Dallas, uh, brought back a lot of tools for us to, to, to use out in the field. Uh, we did, of course, our active shooter training with the Sheriff's Office at Soros Police Department. Uh, task Force officers attended Texas Narcotics Officers Association. Uh, we had a firearm simulator, and I'll show you some pictures on that. Uh, Officer Karina, Officer Lee Montgomery, and I, we completed our International Police Mountain Bike Association. Uh, I knew those two girls, ladies, 
uh, for our best fit. They were always at the gym. And so I knew they could, they could pull this through. I felt responsibility because I was the one that brought this upon our police department <laughs> to put myself through this. When I was walking home, you participate. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I was walking home stiff on Wednesday night, and <laughs> Belen goes, "Don't even say anything to me. You brought this upon yourself." <laughs> <laughs> so that Wednesday night, we did 21 miles, Ooh. and uh, we started at five o'clock that morning. We made the uh, the trip all the way to the big hill, got to the top of that, and then we flew our way back down. Uh, mm -hmm. It was great experience. Um, I told the instructors that I will never forget it. I, I being 51 years old, I was very proud of myself. <laughs> so, uh, but we, we got through it. Um, Sergeant Aaron Villanueva, uh, Corporal Watch Office attended training in El Paso. Uh, as you all know, we, we have a fentanyl problem, opiate problem in, across, our, across our world, but we also have it here in Alpine. And so um, one of the things that we are experiencing is fentanyl. And uh, unfortunately, um, we have used our Narcan, uh, and Narcan is to assist us in reviving persons that are uh, unconscious with the use of opiates. So um, uh, this assisted our agency with, with training and to make sure that we're, we're careful. Uh, Alpine is a pipeline. We all know that a lot of the narcotics go north but it, it trickles its way back down. And so Odessa is unfortunately one of the worst uh, hit areas with the, the use of uh, the narcotics. And so unfortunately it's, it's making its way back down to Alpine. And so we had TMPA come down and they provided a, right here in our, in our civic center. I, I, I wish that I could have had them stay a little bit longer to, to have you all just to experience it. Uh, police simulator. Uh, we heard of, uh, our virtual reality goggles going, um, and uh, I participated as well. It was it was good experience for me um, to to see some of the things that that uh, that takes me out of experience. You know, it, it keeps us keeps us refreshed. And so, uh, right there's a <coughs> sent you all a picture of uh, that's Officer Montgomery there, and then the other one below it is uh, uh, Lieutenant Kirk Hoffman. In the next photo we have our when we made it to the top of the hill. Uh, that's uh, Officer Garina uh, getting our selfie. <laughs> it was a, it, again. It was it was great training, and then uh, that was our last day when we we had our certificates. One of the tell you one of the at first I was scared about the stairs. I went up the stairs uh, after some training. Uh, what what I had the hardest time completing was a circle within a triangle or within a a square, and uh, it was a pretty much a tight. And just to to be able to to just look forward to what I'm going to, it was it was that was hard for me. But <laughs> so uh, August statistics. Next slide is uh, 919 dispatch calls, 707 officer calls for service, 41 case reports, 138 traffic stops, 263 911 calls. September statistics, 648 dispatch calls, 552 officer calls for service, 38 case reports, 175 traffic stops, 183 911 calls. And uh, did, they, did they get the flyer? The flyer? I, um, I have a flyer that I'll, I'll send out next, uh, to y'all. Um, Alpine Police Department, we're, we're understaffed 25%. We have lost three officers within the last six months. And uh, um, it's a flyer tied to, for recruiting. We're, we're gonna be going to El Paso Community College to hit their academy again. Um, I've discussed some ways with Megan to try to get these officers to stay here a little longer. And uh, we also were teaching at the University Academy and uh, they have a good group of officers. It looks like we're gonna be, high, right now we have, Looks like we're gonna have one hired, uh, depending on he how he does on his on his final on his state exam. <clears throat> so uh, again, we're down more than twenty five percent, and uh, so I encourage anybody that if 
Soros has a good uh, law enforcement academy. If you ever, ever want to go through the academy, they currently have a, a 75 year old attending the academy and wow. uh, he's doing pretty well. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> and, um, never too late. So, there's hope for me. Yeah. Right. Uh, there was, uh, we made the movie on yeah. the senior. So, uh, I encourage uh, Sheriff Dotson and I, we, we kind of joke around, um, but uh, yeah, we're all agencies across Texas are in desperate need, but here in Alpine, we are a small community. It, it, it's hard to draw people down to Alpine to stay in Alpine. And so one of the things that helps us out is trying to stay local, trying to keep them with family. And so that does help us out. Uh, made me stick around for 28 years so so um any questions please uh uh i have always have an open door uh y'all are more than welcome to talk to me okay thank you thank you yeah, thank you okay next up gas department come on up hello everyone randy was one uh gas utility director Given my three quarter my three quarter report, uh, TML audit recommendations, which uh, hasn't really changed. They're still requesting everything that's on here for us to kind of look at and see if we want to go that route with some of the things like. Uh, um, well, let me just read them out to you. Uh, continue to review cover tasks and normal operating procedures and operations and maintenance manual and update as necessary, which we do that constantly. Uh, qualify and requalify personnel as necessary on cover task procedures and responses to abnormal operating conditions and document the meetings. We do that every three years. Review drug and alcohol testing procedures to ensure compliance. That gets audited every every year also. Review the damage prevention and public awareness programs as necessary. We do that every year also. Review the expanded requirements for excess flow valves. That's a new uh, poly excess flow valve that goes underground that makes it safe for everyone as we're doing new uh, replacement from steel to poly. We install those at all service lines so that it, what it does is if it ever gets run over, a meter gets run over, it actually stops the gas under underground. Gives us time to go over there, do the repair above ground, and then it'll re-energize itself to full pressure again. So very, very nice little thing there that Railroad Commission came up with to make it safe for everybody. Uh, review the distribution integrity management plan annually and update as necessary. Uh, DIMP records must be kept for 10 years. We've got all those records, even from the corporation, so we'll never get rid of those records. <laughs> it is also recommended the operator consider purchasing a remote methane leak detector, RMLD, to reduce the cost of repeated leak surveys and improve emergency responses. That would be nice if we could do that one day. The equipment runs anywhere from twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars, but you buy once, you get the the recalibration system. We could do our own leak surveys every year, probably for four years. I would like to do three years and then bring an outsource that we do it every year anyway, so it could save a little bit of money, and then it would save itself. Uh, we would save money uh, by not doing it every year with the outsource and it would pay for the equipment within time. Uh, it is also recommended that the operator consider purchasing well, river that sorry. Systems should also be inspected to ensure adequate protection from atmospheric corrosion. That's every day. That's continuing surveillance. <clears throat> uh, TML audits 2019 through 2022. Uh, we're still pending on the 2022 uh it came a little late this year we usually get that audit around may uh the person that was doing it for many years passed away uh so they had to recruit someone that knew kind of 
the ropes on how to do it. And he just came actually last month. So that's why it's pending. Uh, he said there was no problems. We've been hitting the 90s, upper 90s. I'm pretty sure we'll get the upper 90s again as soon as we get that back. Uh, 2022 leak survey, it hasn't changed much. Uh, all those are still pending, uh, but no, no grade leaks. Everything, the grade ones, grade twos, which are grade ones need to be repaired immediately. Grade twos, we've got six months to do them. All we have is grade threes. So we're currently working on all of them. Uh, next, we go to the... 2022 Fort Davis DIMP progress. We've already completed all the DIMP, uh, the distribution integrity management uh, program for Fort Davis is completed. And then we're currently working on the, the, the one for Fort Davis. As you can see, we, our goal for this year was 37 services. Uh, we've already removed and replaced 18 of those 37. We've got three right now in progress, which will leave 16 pending, and we have to the end of December to complete. So hopefully if the rain slows down a little bit, we can get back on them. <laughs> uh, Alpine distribution system, quick review, uh, just kind of what we're about. The city of Alpine provides natural gas to the citizens of Alpine and Fort Davis. The city of Alpine operates 73 miles of Maine, of which 58 miles are located in Alpine, 15 miles in Fort Davis. That's a lot of miles of gas lines. The city of Alpine has implemented a distribution facility replacement program in accordance with the Texas Administrative Code Rule 8.209, which is the replacement, which that's DIMP. That's where we had to come up with the DEMP program. In accordance with the TAC 8.209, the city of Alpine will replace 37 services of Alpine and six services in Fort Davis, which Fort Davis has already been completed. So uh, everything looks good for, for the year. Everything is probably three quarters of the way done. Uh, I don't foresee any issues. The new DEMP plan, which will come in March, once we enter all these numbers of what we've done for the year, uh, the way DEMP works is on the risk model is everything as we're doing, it actually brings down the numbers. As long as there's no problems like uh, vehicle hits on meters, that goes into the, the plan. Excavation hits for people not calling 811, not getting locate tickets digging illegally, uh, those kind of things go into the risk model, which will then change wherever we're having to do the work. Uh, so that's it on the DIMP and on what we do and where we're at. Uh, the other thing that was brought up on our uh, gas loss, uh, just so that we let everyone know, uh, we're at a half percent gas loss for the year. I forecast that we would be at a negative after the next few months. Uh, it kind of fluctuates. Uh, half a percent is not a whole lot, uh, not to worry about. It's not like gas is just going everywhere. Uh, I think the issue that we had for some of this gas loss was when we had those issues when we were losing the regulators uh, back in January and February. We had to go on bypass, so to me, it just didn't register through the through the meters because it was going directly into our distribution system. But like I said, half a percent. Normally, every year we're always at a negative, so we really don't have a whole lot of gas loss. The only time that I would see that we would need to worry about our gas loss, uh, according to Texas Railroad Commission standards, is if we go above five percent, and we've never never gotten that close. So. The system's good. The system keeps getting better as we keep working on it. So just rest assured you've got a crew out there that's doing what they need to do and we're gonna continue doing it to keep the, the community safe. So do y'all have any questions? Thank you, Randy. Uh -huh. I just have two comments. First, thanks again for this guest loss report. I 
brings back memories of the old, uh, the old days. <laughs> yes, sir. yes, sir. And these numbers we have to provide uh, sir, for those that don't know these these numbers are are calculated every month. Uh, when we go through our uh, audits with the feds, the FEMSA 7100, they request the yearly. And of course, we have to submit that form, which is a uh, EIA 176. So they get these numbers early. That's how they keep track. It's not just because we came up with numbers. These have to go to, to the Railroad Commission and the feds. So. Then I want to thank you for, I don't know if gassing is the right word, but mowing the weeds in front of the post office. Oh, no, you're very welcome. I, I know that we use it going back and forth. I got tired of seeing the weeds this high in the front there. So I mowed it down for everybody that uses it here across the street. And I just continued with the whole thing afterwards. And he got stuck. <laughs> and I got stuck. Yes, I did. The riding mower, man, I couldn't believe how muddy it was. And unfortunately, like I said, the weeds were this tall. <laughs> And I was going real, real good on my riding mower, and all of a sudden it just bloop. <laughs> I was sitting there, and we were just spinning a while. So yeah, but no, it, it's all mowed. It's all nice and clean. So. All righty. Well, Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay. okay. Well, y'all have Thank a good you. evening. Thank you. All right, moving on to public hearings. Public hearing to obtain citizen view and views and comments on the second and final reading of Ordinance Twenty Twenty Two Dash. 10-01 and ordinance amending chapter 10 animals to the Alpine Code of Ordinances amending article two, keeping animals, amending sections 10-48, registration of dogs and cats, providing for updated registration fees and procedures for the registration of dogs and cats. Is there anyone here to comment on this? Okay, see none, moving on. Public hearing to obtain citizen views and comments on Ordinance 2022-10-02 and Ordinance amending a typographical error in Ordinance 2022-08-03, levying ad valorem taxes for use and support of the municipal government of the city of Alpine, Texas for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, providing for the apportioning of each levy for specific purposes and providing when taxes shall become due and when the same shall become delinquent if not paid. Is there anyone here to comment on this? Okay, seeing none, moving on to consent agenda. City Secretary. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight's consent agenda has two items. Item one, approval of October 4th, 2022 regular meeting minutes. And item two, approval of the fourth quarter investment. Okay, I need a motion. A motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. I need a second. Second. Okay. Let's vote. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay. Passes unanimously. All right. No information or discussion items. Let's move on to action items. City manager. The first one is approved the second and final reading of ordinance 2022-10-01. An ordinance amending Chapter 10, Animals to the Alpine Code of Ordinances, amending Article 2, keeping animals, sorry, keeping animals amending Section 10-48, registration of dogs and cats, providing for updated registration fees and procedures for the registration of dogs and cats. And I was asked to provide a little information before you guys motion and vote. Um, this for the public who may not have seen the packets that are online. Um, the main portion of this that's been amended is the registration fee. It is an increase of a $3 annual renewal fee. So they're just increasing the registration fee for both altered and unaltered pets. Okay, I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the second final reading of ordinance 2022-10-01. Okay, I need a second. A second. Discussion? Okay, see none, let's vote. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, passes unanimously. Moving on to action item number two, city manager. Approve the first and final reading of ordinance 2022-10-02, an ordinance amending a typographical error in ordinance 2022-08-03, 
levying ad valorem taxes for use in support of the municipal government of the city of Alpine, Texas for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, providing for apportioning of each levy for specific purposes and providing when taxes shall become due and when the same shall become delinquent. A little background information, um, when the tax office was about to send out all of their tax notices, um, they realized that our ordinance didn't quite add up. Um, we went through and double checked. Um, a zero was accidentally left off on the INF rate of 0 0.035701. All of the backup and supporting documentation was correct. The intention for the INS rate was to include that zero. Unfortunately, when I typed up the actual ordinance, um, that zero just got left out. So we're asking to amend so that it is correct. Otherwise, our tax rate would be higher than anticipated. Okay, I need a motion. I make a motion. We approve the first and final reading of ordinance 2022-10-02. Okay, I need a second. Second. Discussion. Okay, see none. Let's vote. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, passes unanimously. Moving on to action item number three. City approved. manager. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm ready. Yeah, you ready. Approve the first reading of ordinance 2022-10-03, an ordinance establishing chapter 16, boards, commissions, and committees to the Alpine Code of Ordinances, amending processes, procedures, guidelines, and requirements for city boards and committees. This actually started in January of 2022. Um, it probably started in 2013 when I started here, <laughs> but it actually took some, some girth here at the beginning of this year, um, discussion with council back and forth on the different boards, the purpose of each board, trying to put something that was similar across all the boards and conditions, terms, um, how they get appointed, um, how long they last, how they can be removed, what is the purpose of them. Instead of going through and amending each of the chapters and articles that these boards all laid in, we move them into a single chapter, which would be chapter 16, um, and brought them all together, put in rules and procedures, put in some decorum, much like what the council is currently following, put in set terms, and then went through and changed all of the other ordinances with removing those. Um, it's been before council multiple times for several months, getting feedback kind of a back and forth, what do we want, what do we don't want. Um, GEO has worked really hard on getting something prepared. Um, we know there's always gonna be changes, it can happen at any time, but we feel that we've got something in place for council to start making some decisions on, um, including the feedback that has been provided by each of you, including Ms. Rodriguez, who is not here tonight. Okay, I need a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the first reading of ordinance 2022-2022. 10-03 uh, with the amendment to dissolve the airport board. Second that. Okay. Discussion? I'll discuss my opinion of it. We've gone back and forth on the airport board. We currently have one member. They have not reported to us since 2019. We have currently have probably 12 applications pending. They're not going to meet any of our standards. We're still not going to have anybody on it. I'm, I'm suggesting we dissolve it right now. If we get feedback in the next six months, we'll, we'll address it then and maybe reestablish it. Any other discussion? Okay, let's vote on the amendment to dissolve the airport board. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, the amendment passes unanimously. Let's vote on the motion. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, passes unanimously. Okay, action item number four, city manager. Approved resolution 2022-10-09, a resolution authorizing the city of Alpine to participate in the Texas Recycles Day grant program. I don't know how Adelina does it, but she finds the grants that have an open period for two weeks and that is it. Um, this one came up. It is a Coca-Cola Southwest beverage sponsored grant. Um, it is kind of a answer some questions. We'll give you some money. Um, as part of our grant authorization process, we do have to take it before council. 
Adelina is looking at obtaining some 18 gallon curbside recycling bins with the appropriate stickers on the side of those bins, which would indicate what should go in the bin, as well as city logo. Um, we're estimating not quite $5,000. Um, quotes and documentation have been provided with this application for you to review. Um, costs always change. So we are requesting 5,000. Okay, I need a motion. I vote to approve resolution 2022-10-09. Okay, I need a second. I'll second that. Okay, discussion? I have one question about it. These are curbside. Who's going to pick them up? So these would be used by the city, especially during events. Okay. So we have a small group of them right now that we kind of help give out to different places and some of our city buildings are. So she'll be utilizing them for events and at the recycle center and for things that the city needs. Because I have three left over from other programs. Still make them back. Well, I use them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Okay, it passes unanimously. Action item number five, city manager. Approved resolution 2022-10-10, a resolution authorizing the city to participate in agreement with the state of Texas through the Department of Transportation to request the closure of North Highway 118 between Holland Avenue and Avenue E on November 18th through November 20th, 2022. The city of Alpine is required to pass a resolution asking TxDOT to close the fifth street right between the two runways um, in order for Art Walk to host their event. We've done this for 29 years, um, 29th Art Walk. Uh, so it, it's just got a formality that we provide to TxDOT so that they can move forward with notifying and, and blocking it off. Okay, I need a motion. I so move. I need a second. Okay, discussion. Okay, see none, let's vote. All in favor, raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Okay, action item number six, city manager. Approve fiscal year 2022-2023 tax collection agreement with Brewster County. Uh, we do have an agreement with the county to collect our taxes. Um, they mail out our tax notices. They collect the payments on behalf of the city and they deposit them in the appropriate accounts on behalf of the city. This is an annual contract that does include a 5% increase. Um, this is where I got the idea to do it with our other agreement with the county for the recycling. Um, it is, like I said, a one-year contract. Um, the county has already discussed it. They're pending city approval. Okay, I need a motion. I'll make a motion here, Craig. Fiscal year 2022-23 tax collection agreement with the county. Okay, I need a second. I'll second. Okay, discussion. All right, see none, let's vote. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, passes unanimously. Action item number seven, city manager. Authorize the city attorney to initiate contract discussions with Stephen Daughtery for use of Daughtery Well Number One for long-term city use. I, I do apologize, there is a typo. Numbers just seem to be in my way today. Um, 2022, June of 2022, the city issued the drought contingency first phase. It was a voluntary phase because of inaccuracy of our equipment. The water's there. We were just having issues with our equipment to get it out. Um, because the location of these wells mm -hmm. is the Sun England area, um, we're limited to, of course, the water supply. When you have two wells go down out of three, it makes it really rough. Mr. Daughtery had approached the city um, and said, hey, how can I help? Um, he does have a vested interest in the city. His family is a longtime resident of the city. Um, for several years, the city did have access and utilize one of the wells on his property, um, Daughtery Well 1. He offered for us to use it as a, a temporary emergency use. Or as we further discussed, he suggested possible long-term use. I asked the utility department to do some research on how would we go about taking this well back and what, you know, what were the steps. 
Um, Mr. Seeger did come back with the first step um, from TCQ would be to have a contract for the well before we could actually move forward with any of the other process. Um, so I have provided the, the notes that did come back from the utility department as well as some TCQ information. Mr. Daughtery, um, and I believe one of his, uh, I wanna say maybe his attorney is online to uh, ask me or answer any questions you may have. Um, but in order for us to move forward with even considering it, we'd have to have a contract in place. This is not asking the council to approve anything except for to start the negotiations between our attorneys so that if something did come about and an agreement could be made that we could move forward with it. The actual cost of taking back over this uh, well are unknown. Mr. Daughtery does have a very lengthy and detailed list of everything that has been done with that well, repairs, maintenance, a meter, how much has been pulled, what it can, everything that goes with it, um, which will benefit the city if we move forward with it. I just would really like to get the process started. It has been brought before council um, on several occasions. Um, we can't move water from Mooskies over to this side of town. Love to, you've got some horsepower out there, but we don't have it over here. Um, down the road, the city will need to look at how do we bring in our own wells. But for right now, this will give the Roberts Wells a rest so that we can get them up and running to the level they need to be. Um, just like a car, your engine wears out over time. Those wells are running out. Okay, I need a motion. I'd make the motion to approve the city attorney to initiate con contract discussions with Stephen Daughtery for use of Daughtery Well One for long term city use. Okay, I need a second. I'll second it. Okay, discussion. I don't have any discussions. I have a comment. Thank, thank the Daughtery's for stepping up and doing this because they didn't have to. I, I think it's wonderful that they're willing to help out the city that we all love. So. Especially with something as big as water. Uh, they actually did want to speak, so. Oh, okay. Oh, All right, ahead. sure. Go ahead. Uh, yes, good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council members. My name is Sam Ballard. I'm an attorney and uh, represent Dr. Stephen Darby. He was just here online just a moment ago and had prepared some comments for City Council, but uh, he just messaged me that his computer unexpectedly had an update. So he's not available to, to provide his comments. Uh, but I have some uh, that I can share with the city council. Glad to hear that the city council is, uh, sounds like uh, going to uh, vote to approve us entering into lease negotiations. Just some history about the well to share with the city uh, and its productivity. Uh, so Dr. Daugherty's father actually strategically chose the location for uh, this well back in 1953 as an irrigation well. Uh, he pumped as much as 500 gallons per minute for irrigation at that time. And then through 1955 through 1958, uh, the well actually provided approximately half of the city's groundwater. At that time, uh, the Daugherty's and the city had a lease in place. Uh, and actually back in 1955 and 1956, uh, there was documented production of about 106 million gallons per year. Uh, and then the lease at that time had expired. Uh, again, the Daugherty's and the city had entered into another long-term lease from 1965 to 2005. Uh, and during that time, the well averaged uh, production of about 43 million gallons of water per year for the city. And if we uh, can reach uh, a long-term lease with the city, which I'm, I'm sure that we can, uh, Dr. Daugherty plans to dedicate production from his number one well for the city for public water supply. And then he plans to use his other wells for his own irrigation purposes. So um, he would definitely be uh, accommodating the, the city in that respect. Uh, right now he is permitted by the Brewster County Groundwater Conservation District uh, to produce about 97 million gallons of water per year uh, from that well. We have already started discussions with the Groundwater Conservation District about amending his permit to allow for city use of this well. So we've already gotten the ball rolling uh, and have a path forward on getting uh, the district permitting all squared away. 
Uh, and we're uh, really excited about the opportunity to work with the city again. Uh, the Daugherty's have always had a, a really good relationship with the city. And uh, he looks forward to maintaining that relationship uh, going forward. So uh, happy to try to answer any questions that y'all might have. And thank you all for your time this evening. Oh, and Dr. Daugherty's back. So uh, Dr. Daugherty, I, I just provided your comments for you, but uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I apologize. My, my computer decided to update on me. I'm back. Um, this well provided more than half of Alpine's water from 1955 through 1958. And uh, then a lot of Alpine's water from 1965 through 2005, uh, as much as 106 million gallons of water a year. And uh, we have a permit from the Water Conservation District uh, that uh, is enough to produce more water than the well averaged for the city in prior years, plus uh, continue my irrigation uh, efforts on the ranch. We average 43 million gallons of water a year uh, for the city during the years for which we have data, uh, 27 out of the uh, 48 years, I believe, out of the 43 years. So it's a lot of water we have been able to provide. I can use my other wells for irrigation and devote this number one well, which has been such a great producer to the city if we reach a deal. Thank you. Dr. Daugherty, I think you were off when I commented. I would just want to thank you and your family for stepping up for Alpine. You stepped up for years of me growing up and now to sit up here and be able to, to approve this, this happening again. I feel very privileged. Thank you. Thank you. We we thought it was a bad idea when the city dropped the lease uh, years ago and knew that the city would be eventually ready to come back to deal with this. And I'm, I'm much more interested in long-term stable deal than some short-term thing. We can provide water as soon as the water district allows us to do so, but I really think it's in everyone's interest to have a long-term deal that allows us the financial stability on the ranch to keep ranching it as a ranch uh, and provide this water without uh, a lot of residential development over where the water comes from. Okay, any other discussion or questions? All right, let's vote. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, approved unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so city council member comments. Council member Stokes. Mm -hmm. Here, I've been taking notes. <laughs> Yay for library week. Go to the library. It's well deserved. They, you know, he, they, he gives those long reports and, and I doze off, but they do so much over there. Um, I'd like to thank our department. Jennifer, Heather, Chris, Daryl, Randy, you know, they give these reports consistently to us so that we're aware of what they're out there doing day to day. We don't need them in here every day. This is what, why we have revamped these boards and commissions because now they're gonna be tasked with coming and telling us what they're doing. We don't know what they're doing. We'll now be sitting in their meetings. That's, that's why we wanted to get these boards and commissions done. Um, Mr. Street, I, I know you're you're anxious to keep that transportation board, but it will be just like the airport board. When we think we need it, we can readdress it. We can always go back and put it back on. Since I've been on here and for years, there's been nobody on that board but you. So yeah, obviously it wasn't working for Alpine then. We thought, see a need for it, we'll revamp it, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Megan. Good job on all those numbers that you put on those pieces of paper and think we're all reading and highlighting. Sometimes I highlight them so, you know, that I'll feel important. Randy, maybe we can find $25,000 for whatever you're at. I don't know what it is, but it sounded good. It's, it's a meat detection equipment. Oh, okay, whatever. And I think, <laughs> I think that's it. That's all I have to say. Council <laughs> member Tandy. <laughs> I think um, you still said it all for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Megan and Gio, for all that you do. And I want to invite everybody to the Marathon to Marathon that's happening this weekend. I'll be running. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Council Member Stokes. Very Stokes. informative city staff reports. Yes. Thank you. 
Okay, Council Member Johnson. Well, I have to kind of dovetail on Judy and Martine, but certainly the, the, the department had reports we got tonight is indicative of the good hands that the city of Alpine is in and it's appreciated. Thank you. And I'm the same. I think Judy said it all. Thank you, department heads, directors. Thank you for the, the presentations that you give us for keeping us updated. We appreciate it. Thank you for all the hard work to all of our city employees. And you need to start it. down here the next time, and then Judy won't. Yeah, no. Let me go and do that. Uh, I'm <laughs> when you move your house in my world. <laughs> All right. Judy, <laughs> <laughs>